So to tonight, uh, as I said, we've brought Asian Americans to our stage from all manner of backgrounds and professions, uh, and we're very glad tonight to bring two Asian Americans uh, to this stage and to the Asian Society who are serving the United States Congress uh, to speak about their own paths to leadership and how their backgrounds inform uh, their service uh, every day uh, up here in the metropolitan area and, of course, down in Washington. Um, and it should be said, uh, and it should make the conversation all the more interesting, as we were just talking, uh, their backgrounds and their constituencies are really pretty different. Uh, Congresswoman Grace Mung is serving her fourth term in the House. She represents the 6th Congressional District of New York, uh, represented, by the way, in the past by Hamilton Fish, Horace Greeley, among other New York uh, notables. Uh, the New York 6th encompasses the Great Borough of Queens, of course, and Grace Mung is the first and only Asian American member of Congress uh, from New York State. Uh, prior to serving uh, in the Congress, she was a member of the New York State Assembly and before that a public interest lawyer. Congressman Andy Kim was elected to the House just last year uh, in November, a real nail-biter, uh, by the way, nine days, is that right? Yep, okay. Uh, Andy Kim represents the third congressional district in New Jersey, stretching from the Delaware River to the Atlantic, uh, most of Burlington and Ocean Counties. He is a Rhodes Scholar, national security expert, uh, served at the Pentagon, State Department, and the White House uh, National Security Council, uh, and served overseas uh, in Afghanistan. So utterly different backgrounds, very different constituencies. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, delighted uh, to have you both with us. Just a quick reminder, um, as I said at the outset, uh, we have a live stream audience to those watching uh, Beyond this room, you can, as always, email your questions to moderator at asiasociety.org. You can tweet them uh, using the hashtag AsiaSocietyLive, which is the hashtag uh, for these events. We are on the record tonight. Uh, please join me in a warm welcome for Congresswoman Grace Mung, Congressman Andy Kim. So first of all, thank you again. This event was originally scheduled for April, and I was uh, uh, telling our guests just a moment ago that when it was canceled uh, uh, for reasons beyond their control and ours, uh, what was the reason? It was a vote of some kind that... Uh, Probably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I figured, well, that's not ever going to happen again, given that uh, uh, these are two very, very busy people with... Uh, varying commutes uh, between Washington and their districts. So thank you both uh, for coming and coming back. Um, but I, I just to get started, I had a fundamental question, and I thought I'd just say a couple more words about what I just said from the podium about, you know, just how different the districts you represent really are, because I live here, and I was kind of woefully ignorant about some of these, uh, just a few quick facts. First, closer look at the borough of Queens, right? Described these days as the most diverse urban area in the world, I had heard that. Um, but you don't uh, just have some Asian American constituents. You have, if I'm not mistaken, more than one million people of Asian American or Asian heritage in the borough. And in your district, the majority, significant majority, 40% are Asian, right? Uh, over in the third district in New Jersey, What's the percentage? I see about 20, 30,000 maybe. Is that about right? That's about yeah. right. Yeah. So about 3% maybe. That's yeah. right. Okay. Um, so not a particularly diverse community, at least in relative terms or in the terms we're talking about tonight. Congresswoman Mung's district went for Hillary Clinton by 33 points. Part of the reason he had such a nail biter was because the, the sixth in New Jersey went for Third Donald, in New Jersey, yeah. I'm so sorry. Third in New Jersey went for Donald Trump by six points. One of you in your fourth term, one in the first, one of you Korean-American, one of you Taiwanese-American. So all those differences notwithstanding, the question I thought uh, I'd like to start with just to set the stage is <coughs> what does being Asian-American, how does that inform both why you decided to run for office in the first place and then more fundamentally what you do, whether in your district or in Washington on a daily, weekly, monthly basis and all? Start with you, Congresswoman Mung. Sure. Well, thank you, Tom, and to Asia Society for having us here today. This is a real treat. Obviously, I work side by side uh, with Andy Kim, 
uh, in Washington, D.C., but it's not often that we get to literally be side by side <laughs> and, and work together and, and speak on um, such fun and important issues. Um, so my district is about uh, almost 40% Asian American. Um, that's not counting just the electorate, it's uh, the population mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, you know, when I decided to run for Congress, it was in 2012, my predecessor, my seat is a combination of the Gary Ackerman seat and the Anthony Weiner seat. So it was a newly drawn seat mm -hmm. after the 2010 census. Um, and at the time, I had not thought about running for Congress at all. I had really just gotten to the New York State Legislature. I was in the New York State Assembly at the time for only three years. Um, moving on was not something that I had even planned or, or thought about. Mm -hmm. um, but as I was literally on the evening where Gary Ackerman announced his retirement, um, I was calling different people, including the few uh, Asian American electeds who were in office at the time, and there were only a few, so the phone calls took like five minutes. <laughs> John Liu, Peter Ku, and Margaret Chin, that was it. <laughs> um, just trying to gauge uh, what it would look like um, and how, what kind of candidate we would put forward, and just ensuring that that candidate was someone who prioritized Asian American issues, not necessarily thinking it was me, or even another Asian American. I never knew uh, an Asian politician on the federal level that mm -hmm. looked like me personally, so I, I really never thought about uh, even doing it in the first place. It wasn't something that was planned, um, but really very important, I thought, to have voices. So in my bio, before Andy Kim got elected, I used to say that I was the only Asian American in the Northeast, but I'm really glad to give up that title. <laughs> I ruined it for it's, you. It's all right. <laughs> it's my claim to fame, but um, we're happy to have, thrilled to have Andy Kim in Congress. Just before we come to Congressman Kim, then, what happened in those phone calls? Um, well, <laughs> names didn't really come up, you know. It's, probably a smaller pool and a smaller pipeline than it should be. Yeah. Um, and so it was kind of like, you do it, you do it. <laughs> huh. um, so yeah, I mean, all those conversations and planning took about 24 hours. So yeah, we worked real hard really quickly. <laughs> huh. And you were all in, right? Yeah. Now, so Andy Kim, again, partly because uh, the question is, is different just based on, on the makeup of your district. Um, but also, uh, if you can talk a little bit about your path, then um, I actually don't know the answer to this. But what, what was what was your uh, your phone calls? Your uh, who, who came, or did you decide yourself this is something you want to do? Because I imagine yeah. it was it was not really an Asian American thing or an Asian thing, right? It was a what was it? No, it wasn't. I mean, I, you know. Growing up in this district, I mean, this was the congressional district where I did my entire kindergarten through 12 in the public schools there. So, you know, it's been home. But, you know, growing up there, I always understood that I was a minority in the community and um, something that I had to understand what that meant for my own personal identity. And I think one thing that I did very early on because of that is uh, a lot of the issues I was interested in, a lot of the passions that I had in the community, not necessarily for politics. I was never someone who really saw myself going into politics. I never dreamed of running for Congress. Um, but I always had to look at these issues through a sort of a broader lens. You know, there was a lot that I had to do when I was talking to people in my community about different issues where I had to think about what it meant to step into someone else's shoes uh, because I had to have a certain amount of humility that, that I would not be able to you know, represent or, or even understand what the broader thoughts of that district were uh, from just a personal standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, growing up and being a minority was something that taught me a lot of that humility, taught me a lot of that empathy that is required to put myself in someone else's shoes and understand it from that perspective. And you know, kind of coming at this um, as a son of immigrants, uh, you know, that was always thinking about my parents' path and what it was that allowed them to do what they did. You know, my dad and my mother came from South Korea. You know, I always talk about how my dad grew up in an orphanage as a survivor of polio. Mm -hmm. My mom grew up in a poor farm family. And in this country, my dad ended up getting a Ph.D. in genetics here. And mm -hmm. my mom ended up becoming a nurse and just talking about that story. But the way I had to talk about it was not as just a, a Korean-American story or an Asian-American story, but it is fundamentally an, an American story, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is 
ultimately how I learned to talk about my life in this district mm-hmm. in New Jersey that you know because of its makeup um, for me the passions for what led me to do this really were generated within uh, the community you know within that framework of service my parents talked about that constantly uh, it was a guidepost in our lives uh, whether that meant doing what my dad did and try to cure cancer and Alzheimer's or do what I did which was ultimately go into diplomacy and national security that was part of it. But ultimately, the reason I got involved at the congressional le- the run for Congress uh, was that I'm a dad now. You know, I'm a dad of, of two baby boys. I'm worried about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, just in terms of their generation, I'm worried about what it's going to be like for them to grow up as Asian Americans in this time as well. Um, and I felt really passionate about it. Uh, I, had, I had phone calls, too, at the beginning, but my phone calls were mostly telling me, uh, you know, you seem like a nice guy and all, but I'm not sure you should do this. <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of people were saying, like, look, like, you, you know, you're passionate, you're a public servant, but you've never run for office before. Uh, my opponent was also a very wealthy man. I, I am not. I was a, a public servant. Um, and, uh, and, and, look, the district is around... 85% yeah. white and has less than 1% Korean American population and there were zero Korean Americans in Congress. So a lot of people said that, you know, that wasn't mm-hmm. possible from just that standpoint. And um, it was tough hearing that. Mm-hmm. But uh, I come out of 2018 so much more hopeful having seen what happened that this district that was 85% white that voted for Trump by six points just elected the very first Korean American Democrat in the history mm. of our country. Um, and that leads me to feel, you know, really hopeful about what our identities mean mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. what our politics really resonate and what that American story can be about. Well, yeah. Um, so if I have that right, you were talked into running and you wouldn't let yourself get talked out of running, right? Is that... Yeah. Um, if I can just pick up on one thing, if I heard you correctly, Congressman Kim, you said that you didn't want in your district or you didn't feel comfortable sort of highlighting your Korean immigrant status, but you just wanted to say that you were, you know, you had the immigrant sort of American story. Is that right? Were you purposely well, trying to keep that away from the discussion because of the makeup of your district? or I can't hide who I am, nor should I. I'm, yeah. I'm proud to be a, a, a son of Korean, Korean Im- immigrants and raising two uh, Asian American baby boys in my district. You know, that's yeah. a fundamental part of who I am. And never shied away from it. I always talked about the stories of my parents coming from South Korea uh, as immigrants. Um, I think for me, though, the the challenge was how do I make that connect and resonate with other people Mm -hmm. that aren't going to necessarily draw their ancestry or their heritage from similar starting points. And I think that that idea of weaving it and just trying to understand that that someone in the audience here today or at an event that I was doing on a campaign, they might connect with, you know, the the son or daughter of immigrants, or they they might connect with being a father or a mother to two baby boys, or they might connect with, uh, you know, just the mother who's a nurse or some aspect of my story, right? And just trying to find it in that personal side of things. I never talked about really, you know, the stats or anything else about what it means to be Asian American growing up. Uh, I always really tried to relate it as a very personal story, and again, trying to f- make that foundation grounded in some of those issues that I learned, like empathy, um, like civility, um, and and trying to portray the question in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, Congresswoman Mung, you've said uh, recently that whereas you felt that for a time or for a long time the Asian American community or the Asian community in this country had been overlooked, you felt things were getting, there were signs that things were getting better. And I don't know if you're referring to uh, events like Congressman Kim's election, but, but what were you referring to? What are some of the trends you see that give you um, some, some hope? Um, well, first of all, I think it's important, and, and as I head into that, it's still important to realize that even in diverse areas like Queens and New York City, that many people still view Asian Americans as foreigners. Mm-hmm. Um, and we talk about my district with a high API population, but you know, when I was running, I always tell this funny story that um, when I did my first robocall, and most people hate robocalls, right? You all hate robocalls, um, especially yep. from politicians. <laughs> And, you know, I did the <laughs> same robocall that every politician does. Hi, it's Grace Bang. Please vote next Tuesday, blah, blah, blah. 
I had such a tremendous reaction and response from the community because yeah. there were a lot of people who didn't think that I spoke English. <laughs> there were people who only uh. saw my face and picture on a poster. So this is Queens, New York, right? Um, in a district that's very different from Andy Kim's. But it's still important to, to realize that with so many of, of our achievements, we still have um, a long way to go. Um, I think in terms of how far we've come, one thing I think of is um, as we head into the 2020 elections, and I, that might be what my comment was related to, mm -hmm. and I won't get too political, but don't worry, we're on the same side. <laughs> um, you know, I think that oftentimes for those of us who've been involved in campaigns or at least have observed campaigns on a, a federal and local level, oftentimes Asian Americans are uh, left out of the conversation. So many times I hear people, uh, including people in our own party, talk about um, struggles of, let's say, uh, the black and Latino community. And I always wait, like hanging, because mm -hmm. I think they're going to say, and Asian. And oftentimes they don't. Mm -hmm. So my part-time gig in Congress, and you, you'll experience this too, is to raise my finger and say, and Asian, <laughs> right, <laughs> after the end of many conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but. You know, I think that as we head into the 2020, so I also chair the political arm of the Asian Caucus in Congress, mm -hmm. and we wrote a letter to all the presidential candidates uh, reminding them that AAPIs are the fastest growing community uh, in this country, fastest growing demographic, and to please take advantage and use the AAPI Congress members like Andy, like myself, as a resource mm -hmm. that it is incredibly important to reach out to our communities. Um, early uh, and, and in advance. And so we've seen some of this. Some of our candidates have hired APIs at the most senior levels. Mm -hmm. Some have already reached out. Some are asking questions that seem really basic to some of you in mm -hmm. the audience, but like, you know, how do I reach out to ethnic media outlets, things like that. And so I am really heartened by this, uh, what, what I view to be as, as progress. Do you want to add to that at all? Do you, I mean, again, every, th every question sort of has a, you know, your district, your district. By the way, how many people here have been to the Queen's Library in Flushing? Okay, well, this is an Asia Society crowd. <laughs> if I mean, Andy wasn't here, I'd tell you it was the best district in the country. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think I, it's I, the busiest I, library, busiest public library in the country. But also, I mean, just, uh, you know, circulation. you can talk all you want about the numbers, but... Uh, I just think, you know, there's, and also about the fact, which we haven't gotten into really, that um, in, in the same way that Asia is not a monolith, Asian Americans are not a monolith. And all you need to do, if you want to understand that, is walk the stacks there. I'll never forget the first time I went there, and, and there's a Chinese film section, and some very nice person said, are you looking for Shanghai film, or are you looking for, you know, the, the, and I, uh, you know so it's, it's like you can, um, but uh, where, in your district, then, do you see, do you see, have you seen signs of hope of the sort that Grace Mung was just talking about, meaning, uh, you know, uh, in, in the way either you are treated or the issues that you care about in the Asian American arena are, are handled, or is it just kind of a non-issue because it's not that kind of district? Well, I certainly see it as, as progress in, in every direction, but, you know, similar to what uh, Congresswoman Meng said, you know, there, there is progress there to be done, uh, but I think we have to understand that you can't make any assumptions about the direction in which it goes. You know, I, I think about, you know, personally on my end, you know, my district, I remember there was a, there's a Korean American church right on the border of my district. A lot of people that go there are, live in my district. And I went there just a couple days before election day. And I, you know, I was, I was just talking with people. There were a lot of people excited, like, oh, I see you on TV. I'm really excited that you have a chance of winning this. And I said, like, make sure you get out there and vote. And this woman was just like, oh, I'm not registered. And, and she didn't say it apologetically. She just she she, she followed it up with saying, "I'm not political," um, and this was just you know that was kind of how she talks about it, right? And um, that was impactful for me, right? That uh, that in all the outreach that we had done in this district, mm -hmm. reaching out to people, trying to register to vote, and and uh, I had the chance to become you know the first Korean American elected to Congress in, in decades, and only the second ever in the history of our country, and somehow we hadn't quite connected mm -hmm. with her mm -hmm. and, and people in my own district, right? 
Um, and I, I, so I think about this just from a very personal standpoint, like just having gone through this process, recognizing the sheer number of people in my community or in my personal network that were not, either not registered or not regular voters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think what I'm trying to convey is about the, it's about the importance of you know, having that voice in the room and that seat at the table. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping that my actions in Congress start to showcase some of that to people in my district, uh, to Korean Americans, to others, uh, just what benefits come with that and, and how you can actually organize and build political power in this country. So um, I certainly see the progress being made. Uh, I certainly see it from my own angle in many different ways, from you know when I started up at the State Department and not seeing a, not that many people uh, look like me working at the State Department to see more and more people stepping up. And I think this new generation of leadership, either on the political end or across the spectrum in business and education and others, I'm excited to see where it's going. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm excited to be a part of that. But uh, as with everything, uh, we can't assume that a trajectory of demographics, like the Congresswoman said about the fastest growing, doesn't mean that it's going to register as being the fastest growing political force in this country mm -hmm. or the fastest growing political community in this country. And uh, I think that that's kind of where my head is at, is like how do you convert uh, the, the sheer potential mm -hmm. to something that's going to be active and something that's going to be engaged? And, and I don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, but we've started to see the glimmers of that, and that gives me hope, and that gives me a sense of the positive direction, as Congresswoman Meng said. So back back uh, to the, the notion of monolithic <coughs> Asian or Asian American, you know, just avoiding the uh, the trap you can fall into by just using that term like that. Do you think, um, or, or should I put it this way, what do you think is it are the issues of importance to Start again, Grace Mung, with you, to your constituency, your Asian American or Asian constituencies. And I'm very mindful, again, that, you know, somebody who arrived recently from Bangladesh, that means one thing, somebody a generation ago from Vietnam, somebody two generations ago from China, and so on and so forth. But do you, uh, do you in your work, think through all those little, those different iterations? Or do you think, no, these are things that matter to Asians in this country writ large? Um, that's a good question. It's, it, it depends on any given week. It depends on conversations I've had. Um, you know, so for example, sometimes they lean towards symbolic, sometimes they lead towards more funding for certain programs mm -hmm. that benefit our communities. Um, one of the first bills I worked on in the state legislature when I was there um, was for the city to recognize Lunar New Year as a public mm -hmm. school holiday. Um, this stemmed from just my experiences growing up. You know, growing up as a kid in New York City, I always got Rosh Hashanah off, and don't get me wrong, I loved having Rosh Hashanah off. <laughs> Two days. Um, but at some point I realized, why am I going to school on the Lunar mm -hmm, New Year mm -hmm. that I celebrate? Um, so it's experiences either that I've had for myself, and now it's a public school holiday um, in New York City, um, or it's listening to experiences from our community. and for. People, it could be anything from something symbolic like that uh, or to even like foreign affairs issue, right? A lot mm -hmm. of our constituents still have relatives and loved ones uh, in their home country and want to make sure that uh, we're working uh, on issues um, uh, related to that. So, mm -hmm. you know, it depends. Now I'm on the Appropriations Committee, so a lot of it mm -hmm. comes through the lens of ensuring that we are starting or expanding certain programs. So, for example, we've been uh, increasing the funding for the Smithsonian's APA Center, right? Mm -hmm. One day we'd love to have a museum just like the Black History Museum um, on, on ca in the Capitol. Um, and so these are just different ways and different avenues to, mm -hmm. to improve the lives of people in our community. If I can ask a kind of a question that has a lot of uh, resonance here at the Asia Society, we've, we've, you know, we pay a lot of attention, obviously, to the various ups and downs, and lately been a lot of downs in the U.S.-China relationship. And one of the manifestations of that here is, um, I don't need to tell you, but, uh, you know, uh, very close scrutiny of Chinese scientists, Chinese students at universities here. Does that kind of um, activity here play into your work or not so much in, in terms of sort of the news and the 
and the problems that we're having now with China, or is that kind of something you, you steer clear of? Um, it depends. I think at times, you know, KPAC, the Congressional Asian Caucus, mm -hmm. has weighed in on past cases. Uh, for example, scientists like Sherry Chen from right. Ohio, where she not only ended up having uh, all dro charges dropped, but uh, never got her job back. Um, and so it is uh, definitely a case-by-case -case basis, but in a larger picture, it also continues to play into the notion that we as Asian Americans are, are foreigners. And so that's something, it's, it's a balancing act, mm -hmm. um, but you know, as, as Asian Americans, it's something that we try you know, to remind people. Yeah. And Andy Kim, if I'm not mistaken, I've seen you say a few times that you feel that the issues that matter to Asian Americans are really pocketbook issues the same as, as matter to other uh, Americans from different. Is that a fair assessment to you or? Well, uh, for, for in broad brush, yeah. that's right. I mean, I think when I think about what my parents were trying to achieve by, you know, in their lives, you know, they was very much trying to, you know, provide me and my sister with a, a, a better life that has more opportunities. The idea that I can earn more than my, my parents uh, do. And um, I think that that's something that pretty much every parent in this country probably feels, right? And I certainly feel it now that I'm a father of two baby boys thinking about that. So I think that's, that's true. Um, but, I, I, you know, I know that uh, there are going to definitely be, you know, specific perspectives at that of how you get there and what that means in terms of equality and fairness and justice and education and all these different components of it. So it's not just about the vision of what you're trying to achieve. It's also about how you get there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's where... That's where the, the politics and that's where so many of the disputes happen. But um, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, like, uh, you know, these are, these are issues where, you know, regardless of the perspective I'm looking at, I also have to recognize that people are looking at me uh, or making assumptions or expectations about me. Mm -hmm. I think about it very personally as, uh, you know, on the issue you just raised, as, as I'm married to a, a Chinese-American woman, I've got mm -hmm. two baby boys that are you know, Korean and Chinese, mm -hmm. thinking about what kind of world they're going to grow up in. And I remember me being a younger Korean American in this country when I watched, uh, you know, the, the President of the United States at the time call North Korea an axis of evil, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not from North Korea, nor were my parents, but it mm -hmm. is a place that I'm connected to, right? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean for me, who shares a last name with that, uh, you know, with the, with the dictator, <laughs> right? <laughs> So, but like as a as a young kid, it, it it worries you because like you know I, I remember the the concerns after 9/11 with Muslim mm -hmm. American community. Mm -hmm. What if we went to war with North Korea? What would that mean for Korean Americans? I don't mm -hmm. know the answer to that. I hope it's gonna be better than how uh, you know how how things went so poorly for different Muslim American communities after 9/11. Uh, but it's it's scary, mm -hmm. and I think about it from my own end. Uh, I sh I'll share you this one story that I don't talk about too often, but I worked at the State Department for, for you know, as a career public servant. Uh, I had the highest level of security clearance that you can get in the government. I worked at, on Iraq and Afghanistan issues, some of the most sensitive issues in the world. I was not allowed to work on Korea issues. I, I don't, I, I, I had to like appeal in order to be able to take a job on Korea issues. And it was something that, Hmm. My friend, who was born in Brazil, didn't stop her from working on Brazil issues, and it didn't stop someone of German descent from working on German issues, <laughs> um, and and it, it was frustrating to mm -hmm. me, as you can imagine, because I'm being told that you can have all the access to all these secrets mm -hmm. and all these things that our country's doing, sensitive places in the world's most, but we don't trust you enough yet to work on this. And, and, and I was born here in the United States. I don't even speak Korean. <laughs> and I'm just like, what, what is this, right? There's, right. There's, I, I, so, so I understand that there are going to be those types of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we need to constantly be vigilant about them and try to have paths in which we can raise those. Yeah. I, I want to come to some more positive or optimistic things, but just to s stick with potentially uh, not so optimistic things for a moment. Um, with all you said earlier about the campaign and everything else in your district, have you had any um, uh, just sort of on the ground in your district, you know, negative things or repercussions or problems along these lines since you were elected? Or uh, well, uh, you know, there's always there are always those types of challenges. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think during the campaign, um, 
you know, there was, uh, I remember this one time, there was a campaign uh, mailer that was sent out. They kind of put my name in the kind of Chinese takeout font. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, a, there was kind of a tagline that was often used against me in, a, in a attack ads that just said, you know, Andy Kim, he's not one of us. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I, I can't help but mm -hmm. feel certain things because I've heard those words before in my life. Yeah. And I would never want my kids to hear those types of words either, right? So mm -hmm. it, it is something that I experience in a certain way. I'm sure, you know, every member of Congress will mm -hmm. experience some slice of this. Um, but, you know, for me, I always stay kind of focused on, you know, the fact that, um, <clears throat> you know, that I want to, you know, that I have a very precious responsibility here to focus in on the issues and be able to deliver. And I think that's the best way that I can have uh, to be able to push back against whatever types of, mm -hmm. of um, bias there is out there is to show that. I can work for everybody, right. that I'm going to be professional in this operation, I'm going to do it right, <clears throat> and, uh, and hopefully by example I'll be able to, uh, to, be able to push back. Yeah. And I should share just for the audience, uh, again, not getting too much into the politics here, but as a first-term uh, member of Congress Andy, and, and one who won this nail-biter of, of an election, uh, as somebody said in the room just before we came in, the other side obviously wants that seat back. You know, you look around the country and you say, aha, that's one where we, you know, we almost had it and lost. So t to another uh, thing here, and here we're going to have some fun with the audience, okay? <laughs> so we had some fun with the s some members of the staff earlier today. There are among the, I believe, 23, and your staff cannot play this game because they're, they're going to know the answers. There are 23 uh, people who have declared as candidates for the presidency. And there are three Asian Americans in that group. Who wants to guess first? Or who can name the three? Yes. Andrew Yang, correct. Next. Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. I don't know that everybody knows that, but her mother, who is no longer living, was Indian. Who's the third? Tulsi Gabbard. Wow, this is a smart it's, crowd. I'm telling yeah. you. Jeez. They spend all day at the Flushing Library, and then they come here, and they know all the By answers. By the way, we're up to 24 candidates. But. 24? <laughs> Did you declare? No. <laughs> Did something just happen, or is my count off? There is one person. 24. Wow. wow. That was very good, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what's the, what would be the impact? Uh, I guess, t you know, in a way, this goes back to the other question about are there Asian American issues? Are there, um, the, uh, the community has been shown to vote largely Democratic, but as you say, perhaps they just vote uh, you know, pocketbook issues. How, how much would it matter to this, you know, broader point of seeing someone from Asia or of Asian heritage, maybe not in the White House, but maybe, um, do, uh, I mean, talk a little bit about what that means to you. Do you think that's a pitifully small number? Is it great? Is it, you know, uh, well, full disclosure, I am part of the DNC, so I cannot favor or show bias towards any candidate. I wasn't um, asking you to. I wasn't, you know. <laughs> but if there ever were for 2020 or another year um, an Asian American uh, in the White House, look, I, you know, there's a popular saying, you can't be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. And I think for, especially for our young people, it's incredibly important to see role models and leaders, not just in politics, but all different fields. Uh, who look like them and who, who um, feel that, that they are relatable to them. You know, when I first ran for Congress, my kids were little. They were, I think, two and four. And um, one day, you know, I was obviously the only politician or candidate that my kids knew. And one day, my son asked me if men were allowed to run for office. Uh. <laughs> right? So, yeah, some people like that. <laughs> So uh, the, how old was he when he said that? Four. <laughs> so the importance, you know, it's a joke, but, you know, the importance of seeing people who you think, you know, I never thought that I would run for office because I never knew anyone in elected office that looked like me. I just never viewed it as a possibility. I thought one day I could be a staff member in someone's office, um, but it just never crossed my mind that I would run for office. I, I, you know, I, I share a lot of that uh, same approach. I mean, I think a lot of it is about trying to redefine what people think is possible. 
And you know, one one reason why I'm always just so um, uh, honored to be able to work alongside Grace Meng is that uh, when I was thinking about can a Korean American young you know young dad be able, with two baby boys be able to do this, I, I sought a lot of uh, of uh, inspiration from what Grace was able to do and in many different ways both in terms of being Asian American and being a young parent and you know trying to trying to find your way through um, so those are things that I think uh, mean a lot and I think you know just in my short time in Congress so far be able to connect with different you know, my favorite part of, uh, of engaging with different Korean American communities has often been with you know, with students and, and younger mm -hmm. uh, Korean Americans or Asian Americans that are really exciting. They're saying, like, I'm interested in politics now. I might mm -hmm. want to intern in your office and do things. And, and, or at uh, least register. At least yeah. register, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and for me to show that there's, there, there perhaps is a, another way that one can be successful and, 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 and get the, uh, the favor of your parents without becoming a doctor or a lawyer. You know, mm. I think that's uh, a good part of it, too. <laughs> um. I want to. I've just been handed the uh, the iPad, which has questions from beyond the room, and they're they're better than a lot of the ones I want to ask. So we'll come to those <laughs> and and to the audience. But just one more uh, uh, for me, which is, so uh, you know, when I look at your websites and your your platforms, such as they are, you speak a lot about bipartisanship and then, and maybe coming from a very divided district that makes sense and and national service. And by the way, thank you. I didn't say it adequately for your service in Afghanistan. Um, uh, you know, the, the importance of all of that. You, uh, Grace Monk, sit on, as you said, appropriations, uh, Homeland Security, right? Uh, you're on a kids' caucus, if I'm not mistaken. So how does, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of work and a lot of things that really don't have much to do, I don't think, with Asian or Asian-American issues. Um, how do you find a balance, or is there one, to um, deal with those kinds of things or just do the work for the country uh, that those other committees uh, entail? I mean, I think every congressperson would tell you, like, the number and the breadth of issues that any congress member on, on both sides of the mm -hmm. aisle work on is tremendous. So even if we, I think if we wanted to put everything that we've worked on or accomplished onto the website, we probably wouldn't <laughs> have to, wouldn't be able to fit it. So we kind of have to pick and choose. Um, and you know, it, it, it is a diverse district. I think what's what I try to remember always is that all politics is local, um, and so trying to work on issues, trying my biggest priority is to translate what happens in Washington D.C. to the folks back home. Right? Like we can talk about important sounding committees like appropriations and use big words like markup and omnibus, but what does that mean for mm -hmm. the constituent back home? Does it mean that their local museum and their local library gets more money or less money? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of the, the priority and we sort of try to spread the wealth, you know, make sure that everyone in every corner of the district is happy. We represent an interesting area in Queens. Queens is unique. You can't just say Queens, right? It has yeah. to be like, if you tell someone in Bayside what you did for Forest Hills, even though it's 15 minutes away, they're not going to be happy. They want to know how it affects them uh, in Bayside. They're also going to be um, asking for different things, right? Yeah, yeah. so it, it depends, yeah. But we just really, the bottom line is we try to be good listeners and try to be responsive. I think very much in the same category where, um, you know, these issues that we're engaged in and you know working on the armed services committee uh, or the small business committee um, you know I think for me it's a big part of it is you know just what am I hearing from my district you know I, I, I think so much of politics and democracy is about a dialogue you know that's why I promised in my district to hold a in-person town hall every single month uh, make sure that we're having that kind of connection and in the same vein you know I think while I am listening to different Asian American groups and hearing from them, I think that's mm -hmm. a big part of it, just making sure the perspective is being taken into yeah. account. I, I give an example. I'm the uh, chairman of a subcommittee in small business, a subcommittee on economic growth, taxes, and access to capital. Very first hearing uh, that I uh, chaired and had the gavel and I could you know, finally gavel away at things. Um, it, was a, it was a hearing about access to capital for small businesses owned by women, veterans, and, and minorities. Mm. And you know, that is a way in which yep. I am threading some of these and showing that there are similarities between 
you know, different communities or different uh, people and identities as they're trying to get access to capital to be able to start those small businesses. Um, and that is a core part of what I always heard from, you know, the Asian American communities in my area was, was about small businesses. Mm -hmm. Core, you know, it was really the core of that dream that you can come and start your own business and, you know, and be able to provide for your kids. Or in the Armed Services Committee here, uh, Armed Services Committee, uh, you know, while, you know, we're dealing with bigger issues uh, across uh, our entire defense, you know, when I'm talking about and being a voice uh, in Congress about the North Korea talks, Mm -hmm. uh, especially on the, the military side and what does that mean, or about uh, issues that you raised earlier about what is our posture vis-a-vis -vis China. You know, these mm -hmm. are issues that I know the Asian American community is paying very close attention to, mm -hmm. um, and ones that uh, I know that I have a, a voice in, and want to say and want to make sure that that voice is in the room. So those are ways that are, you know, while, while it is kind of woven together and, and threaded together. Thank you for that question. Get your questions ready in the room. We're going to go, though, to Ezra, Pennsylvania, with a nice, small question, okay? Ezra wants to know, in both your opinions, what are the greatest challenges America faces going forward? Yeah. I'm going to do Easy. this in terms of... What time do we have yeah. to be at? <laughs> um, I think, and I hope this question, this answer doesn't sound political. I don't mean for it to be. I think that many different parts of America are heartbroken right now. Whether we're talking about the kids who are separated at the border, whether we're talking about farmers in rural Iowa who are struggling, um, and a whole wide breadth of issues, I think that regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, that people feel like um, things are very gridlocked and, and partisan right now. Um, so it's our job uh, as Congress members, Democrats and Republicans, and I don't think the media reports on this enough, but there are so many ways that we actually do work together mm -hmm. on a da daily and weekly basis um, to help these different segments of our community and our country. Um, sometimes it's hard to realize it this because sometimes, not to blame the media, but it's easy to highlight the, the disagreements and, mm -hmm. and the conflicts. But there are many ways that both sides of the aisle are working together to, to help these various communities. I'll talk about it just in, in two ways. One is, is building off of what, what Grace just said. Uh, just the fragility in, in a lot of people's lives right now is something that is uh, always at the top of my mind. You know, probably this, this one statistic is one that I, I use more than any other, which was that you know, we live in a time right now when 40% of Americans can't handle a $400 emergency. And I think that that really encapsulates the struggles that people are, are, are experiencing right now. And that, that isn't just about health care, it isn't just about wages or tax. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's showing that there's just a, a deeper rooted problem that is existing. Uh, that really needs a comprehensive solution to. Uh, so that is uh, just a fundamental challenge that we face so much just rooted within our own communities. Uh, the second one, I'll, I'll speak on sort of a global st uh, stance. I think uh, the number one question uh, and challenge to the United States over the next 50 years will be what is going to be our relationship and posture to China. I think that'll just fundamentally be something that defines every other aspect of our foreign policy. Uh, I think we are clearly coming out from a you know, into a this paradigm shift, coming out from a post 9/11 world where counterterrorism was in many ways the main focus of a lot of our defense and military and and foreign policy, and now entering this stage of of greater global competition mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with, with a peer. Mm -hmm. And we have not necessarily been in this kind of situation as a nation since the Cold War, um, nor do I think we should take the Cold War as a blueprint of how that happens. That, that then calls upon us to try to reimagine you know, what does great power competition or how, whatever you want to call it, near-peer competition, whatever is the right way to talk about it, <laughs> Uh, what is that going to be defined as, and, and where are we going to go with this? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's going to have enormous repercussions on trade and economics and military defense spending and, and every other aspect of our 
society. So um, those are two two mm-hmm. ones that I I think about constantly that that kind of shape the domestic approach and the foreign policy approach that I use in, 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 down when I'm down in in Congress. Got it. Uh, let's come to the room then. Anybody with a question? Yes, sir. If you can just wait for the microphone, uh, let us know your name. Hi, my name is James. Uh, thank you for being here today. I was curious to hear about your interactions on an individual level with your colleagues in Congress. Um, I'm wondering if you feel that your colleagues make certain assumptions about you based on the fact that you are and look mm-hmm. Asian American, you know, whether that's having to do with your ability to influence uh, people or advocate or, you know, take leadership positions and how, you know, how you have to approach uh, you know, those issues to overcome those assumptions. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak on this one. Um, just trying to think through this. So I, I think for me, I haven't experienced that very much. But you know, one example which I experienced, it, which I thought was, uh, w- which was uh, a fair and, and apt, was when uh, when we we're talking about the North Korea talks. I did have colleagues come up to me and just ask me if that was something I was paying attention to. They were making an assumption about that based on my ethnicity, and uh, but it was it was a correct assumption. It was something that. Uh, you know that I, I certainly was paying attention to, not just as a, the only Korean American in Congress, but also as a you know former uh, national security official in diplomacy. It was, it was kind of hitting a number of different uh, angles of both my personal and professional uh, life. Uh, so uh, you know that was a place where I, I felt that I could potentially have an outsized voice in terms of how it is that we should be going down. So I you know I think that uh, I think about that, but I, I think all in all. I, as I've talked with colleagues on, on both sides of the aisle and getting to know them, um, I've had uh, nothing but good interactions in terms of you know what they're coming to me about and, and how they're engaging me. And I think I've been treated uh, very well with uh, respect from, from members, whether the most senior to the, the other freshmen. So, so far, it's been really good. You want to take that up at all? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think overall it's good. I think people overall have good intentions. And even if they might make uh, some sort of biased comment, I don't necessarily think it comes from a bad place. Um, There have been situations where I remember when I first got there, we were watching like some fight on TV about in another legislature of another country, and someone turned to me and they would be like, we're okay. I mean, you know karate, right? And I was like, I actually don't. (laughs) And then just last week, I was in a room um, with guests talk uh, the topic was like foreign policy you know uh, different countries and you know a a wide range of topics and nations and I walked in the room and uh, this person who was running the meeting was someone from house leadership and I'm not going to tell you which party because you're a smart crowd you'll figure it out Um, they point to me and they're like oh she's Asian she's part of the Asian caucus she cares a lot about Asian issues and I was like thinking I wasn't even going to ask anything <laughs> related to an Asian country but I guess that's not false but to pigeonhole me mm-hmm. um, like that I don't think was totally fair mm-hmm. yes ma'am if you can just wait a moment for the microphone Hello, hi, my name is Sunny, and um, I had a question about um, how, I guess, like party differences and political ideology is kind of formed among Asian Americans. And also, um, if you notice any differences um, among the younger Asian immigrants versus the older Asian immigrants and how they kind of form their political ideologies. And how do you like reach out to those different age groups um, within your communities? Wow, that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I can start. I think the generational focus of your question is very smart Mm -hmm. and something that we need to talk about more. Mm -hmm. So if I'm talking to the API community as a whole, Oftentimes, and I'm just going to really super generalize right now, but when I'm talking to younger folks, folks who have kind of grown up or were born in this country, um, a lot of it might be more issue-oriented, and they might um, align themselves with um, the average 
other, you know, young person um, on that issue in this country, uh, especially if, you know, as, as Democrats. Um, but something that I think we struggle with or we need to do a better job at is communicating with the older generation. So that first generation of immigrants like our parents' generation or our grandparents' generation, um, they might not be as progressive, let's say, on a certain issue. And I think sometimes even, you know, the way that we approach them and the way that we reach out to them is, is, is lacking. And I think we need to do a, a better job at that. Mm. Yeah, um, that's a very thoughtful question of yours, and I'm, I'm trying to think of a, a thoughtful response. I think for me, um, as I've engaged with different communities just in the short time that I've been more uh, uh, politically active, um, what I've come to see, and again, I can't speak for a lot of other different minority groups in this country, could very well be similar, but what it means for grassroots and Asian American world and society uh, is very particular. It doesn't always revolve around politics or political understandings. Oftentimes it revolves around uh, churches or religious institutions uh, that, that some of these identities afford. Certainly for my parents uh, it, that was the case. Um, and uh, or you know different other arrangements in that kind of way and I think you know as I've engaged I think that your you know, grace is right. You're, the generational component of your question is, is really spot on. Um, you know, I, I see it in a very intriguing and, and exciting way where, you know, I think the older generation that I talked to, they are very excited that, I, you know, just a, a Korean American is doing this. And, and frankly, many of them have been Republican voters for a long time, but they're just excited about me being a Korean American, running for Congress, becoming a member of Congress. Um, I don't get that same kind of uniform response from the younger generation. I think that's a good thing. You know, I think it's good that they are not just reflexive and saying, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to get your back because you're Korean American. Um, and it makes me have to, you know, not you know, not just assume their support, but earn it, right? Um, and and I think that that's a really important place to go towards, and and shows the sophistication that is developing within there, um, as Grace was saying, more issue based in some ways, um, and also just requires a just a. A, a different way of engagement, of trying to figure out where to meet them. You know, where if if I wanted to speak with a group of young Asian Americans, like where do I go now? <laughs> you know, and 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 just be able to connect with them. So I think that um, you know that kind of aspect of of it is something I'm still learning. I'm still kind of mapping out how um, how I can connect and and where I think the gravity exists. Uh, but I think it's it's moving in a direction that's showing that level of sophistication and growth um, and development that's uh, that's healthy. Just a, a quick follow up. Uh, uh, it's maybe just an observation, unless you you want to comment on it also. But your question reminds me of something that I read a couple of years ago when the uh, Trump administration instituted the the ban, uh, the immigration ban on Muslims, and um, well, most recent immigrants certainly were, were very much against it and some of them protested. If I'm not mistaken, the Vietnamese American community in particular, the Vietnamese community in this country, uh, there were many who made the point that uh, they felt they had come here under sort of, you know, do you know what I'm talking about? I'm very careful with my yeah, words no, here. but I, they I felt know exactly what you're... Th that they felt they came here under a sort of proper circumstance and that's the way, and, and they were actually in favor, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Uh, I mean, these were just articles. Were, I don't know if there was anything really, you know, any studies done or anything. But just another example of, of yeah. these generational differences. Yeah. Right? I mean, one, one topic that I thought about while Congressman Kim was answering his question is the topic of dreamers. Um, and so, mm -hmm. look, we, whether we're talking to young people or older APIs, we don't have to have them agree on every issue that we agree, that we, we believe in. Um, however, I do think it's, you know, I always think of that Maya Angelou quote, it's not what you do for someone, it's how you make them feel, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's, uh, when I'm talking about immigration, for example, um, I don't want to go and just talk, let's say, only about dreamers, right? Dreamers, I feel like, is something that our younger APIs really relate to, even if they themselves are not a dreamer. Mm -hmm. They likely know someone in their universe that is a dreamer. 
Now, that same topic to maybe my grandparents' generation, you know, they, they're like, well, we got online, you know, why should other people get to cut ahead of the line? And obviously, there's a lot more work to uh, help them understand the complexities of the issue. Um, but that's, you know, as I'm talking to, let's say, like, folks in the Democratic Party and these candidates that we've written to, to explain to them, like, these, we are not a monolithic. We are not just like one topic. You can't just go into any AAPI crowd and talk about dreamers and think that everyone will agree with you 100%. Um, so we'll talk about different issues. You know, there's dreamers, there's family-based immigration, you know. Um, try to help understand why policies are important. Yep. The woman in the second row, I know, had a, her hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, this primarily to Grace, but and Andy, you can also respond. Your constituents are, are mixed. And my question to you is, do you have a feel of the, the mixed uh, set of family or social values? Because you were elected to represent a certain ethnicity. Uh, uh, and perhaps the, the discussion during the campaigns may have been of representation, as opposed to, although you talked about policies and issues, uh, more so representation. And uh, I've worked on a few state, national, and local uh, campaigns and have come across a lot of conservative Asian American voters. And so how does, uh, uh, do you have a feel of their set of values on women's issues, on immigration, on mm -hmm. other, you know, uh, issues? And how does that, how do you influence them or how do they influence you? Yeah, no, that's a really good question and something that we really need to get better at, at tackling. Um, and again, whether, you know, whether I'm talking to candidates from a very local level or to presidential candidates, for me, showing up is half the battle, mm. right? So I can't expect someone who might have very conservative views, even though they're an Asian American, to agree and support everything that I'm fighting for just because I, I look like them. Um, but I really do try to show up uh, where they are. So going to their events, making them feel like we're listening to them. And sometimes the tactics um, are a little more complicated and will take a longer time. So, for example, when I was in the state ledge, we were fighting for the millionaire's tax. You know, I didn't do what everyone else did, which is just to do a rally and then, like, at the end of the day, like, call it, you know, that's done. Our work was a little more complex. We tried to do op-eds in the Chinese language newspapers, for example. We tried to do little groups and explain to them how it has long-term benefits for our community. So we, we can't, there are no shortcuts. We have to put in the legwork. Um, and I, I do find that whether it's Asian Americans or folks from other communities, that it's oftentimes generational. It's not just because they're Asian American that they're mm -hmm. conservative. A lot of it is, is, is based on religion, for example. Um, but, you know, to take time and say, look, we don't have to agree with everything, but this is why we should be like-minded, try to persuade them. Are there but examples? Relationship. I'm sorry. Are, are there examples, again, I pick on your constituency because it is so diverse, where, like, you know, not generational, but just current, people from country X yeah. feel completely opposed to something that people from country Y yeah, well, I'm going gonna, gonna to regret diving into this topic, but oh, education, right? Yes, education, right? Whether it's talking uh, about secondary education, which is a real hot topic for our specialized high schools right now in New York City, um, to university uh, admissions. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, one thing I do try to talk about when I'm first talking to these audiences is, you know, we are immigrants. We are daughters of immigrants. I tell people that when I first went to the New York State Legislature, I was the only Asian elected official. So I couldn't even have my own like Asian caucus, right? Obviously, I'd be by myself. You'd be the chair. Right, yeah. I'd be the chair, everything. I'd have all the titles. <laughs> but what helped me so much as a, a new legislator was that my colleagues in the Black, Latino, Hispanic caucus invited mm. me to join their caucus. So it was a Black, Latino, Hispanic, and Asian caucus. 
and I tell them how much our Asian community has benefited mm -hmm. from the struggles and the fights and the achievements of other communities that have come before us. Mm -hmm. And it's important to view us as, as one. You know, in Congress, the Tri-Caucus, as we call it, the Black, Hispanic, and Asian Caucus, if you add all their membership numbers together, we are a majority of the Democratic Caucus. And that is not, uh, add the women, mm -hmm. it's even better. But uh, that's not something, that's not leverage that, that we use uh, enough of. But education is something that uh, is hot topic right now. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Front row. I, I don't think you're going to regret that. <laughs> <laughs> we might not be done with that. <laughs> uh, David Salfus. I work here in Manhattan. I work for a uh, Fortune 500 company. What is your feeling on or recommendations that you could give a company to promote diversity and inclusion in the workplace? That's a good question. Yeah. Well, KPAC happened to do a study <laughs> on that. <laughs> we started with the Fortune 100 companies. Um, so our chairwoman, Judy Chu, and I, and a bunch of our members, we sent out surveys to Fortune 100 companies, um, many of whom did not respond. Um, but ha they talked about, and we wanted to highlight best practices, right? Um, so what we've heard a bit from some, you know, we probably go speak in front of a lot of these, depending on what you call it, like employment resource groups. Um, and what we've heard, something that we've heard that's helpful is when employees tell us that they are not only that the company is not only you know setting standards but giving but promoting opportunities so are they interacting with folks at the highest levels are they being sort of groomed and given tips on like how and what it takes to be promoted and and to ex get <coughs> achieve these uh, opportunities but just i guess networking and opportunities yeah yeah i think for um for me i mean um i i, I think the from my personal experience and having now worked in, in your business or in, in some of these big private sector companies, but having worked, for instance, at the State Department, which is a large organization, um, and, and how that can, uh, how, what was successful in terms of helping me feel like there's a path here, I think for me it was kind of, it was more of a mentorship type uh, mm -hmm. effort that was really successful for me to understand this. Um, and just in general, I mean, I think mentorship is one of the most important things that that we can invest in um, as a society and certainly different minority communities can invest in as well. Um, I uh, can see just direct benefits to, between some of the mentors I've had in my life and you know, the decisions that I've been able to make. But at the, at the State Department in particular, being able to connect with uh, mentors or develop relationships with people that shared different aspects, whether they were an Asian American leader <clears throat> or, or uh, again, like a, a, someone who, who went through it with a young family, and I could learn from that. You know, though, just having that opportunity made present to me, where I didn't have to go and knock down doors to try to figure out or have that awkward conversation of, like, can I talk to this person, you know? And even if it's not like this person directly said, like said, I will be a mentor to whoever, you know, whoever, um, to have some, you know, just a culture there where, uh, someone who's younger can say like to their boss, like, look, I'd love to just have a chat with this person who's uh, high in the rung and I'm intimidated to go and speak to, you know, him or her. Um, would you help me? You know, just kind of like breaking down some of those barriers and demystifying what it means to rise up the ranks. Um, I think that was helpful for me in a personal experience. And I could see how that would hopefully be helpful to, to different companies like yours. Um, and I hope that those are types of connections that can be fostered. Well, the microphone travels to the next question. How about the young lady in the back there? I just want to, you mentioned Congresswoman Judy Chu. She's the chair of KPEC, right? That's right. Uh, of, the, of the caucus you mentioned. She had a nice quote recently. She's clearly very bullish on the uh, voting power of, of Asian Americans. She said, we've gone from being marginalized to being the margin of victory. Mm -hmm. Anyway, true. yes? Hi, I'm Emily. Um, Andy, I actually volunteered for you during your election, Yay. during your campaign. Um, Thank you. So I'm a freshman in high school, so adding on to your point about education, I was wondering what your view is on standardized testing for 
high school and college admissions, especially uh, pertaining to Asian Americans. Told you that wasn't the end of that talk. Yeah, thanks a lot, Grace. Right? <laughs> well, she's your volunteer. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Did you care who answers? <laughs> Well, I can I can address a little bit about what's going on in New York State, and we really don't have enough hours in the day for this conversation. But, you know, we have a situation in New York City where some of our specialized high schools have a very low rate of African American and Latino uh, students applying uh, or um, enrolled. Um, so, for example, last year's admissions, last year's class, uh, Stuyvesant High School only admitted seven black students. These statistics are not okay, and we all support diversity. However, what I really took offense with in this city was the city's, uh, this administration's attitude and how they did not approach it with trying to find a comprehensive solution, but literally seemed to blame Asian American students mm. who happened to get into these schools and treated them as if they were somehow scamming the system. So that attitude is not okay. Meanwhile, this same city administration uh, has not strengthened gifted and talented programs mm -hmm. in poor and minority neighborhoods around the city, um, which were largely responsible for allowing these students to know about the test, be prepped, and actually get into these schools. <clears throat> these schools weren't always low uh, percentage of black and Latino enrollment. Um, so I think the attitude of many in our leadership in this city uh, is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is sort of my stance right now, you know, whether you agree with standardized testing or not, the approach that the city has taken, I don't believe uh, is proper. You want to jump in on that at all? Well, or? it's an issue that I'm still getting caught up to speed on. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that uh, the first and foremost, I think it's about you know hearing from different communities or hearing from uh, people that are affected by this. And I think that those are some of the things that you know that Congresswoman Mang was highlighting that didn't happen when 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 uh, uh, some of these processes were moving forward and just making people feel like they were heard, that their perspectives were understood. So, you know, these are, you know, the types of things I'm trying to do in my own district within our own standpoints, you know, on education, going around to the different townships, I'm visiting a lot of different schools, sitting down with the parents, um, because it's impossible for me to say I know what's best for, you know, school district in, in Barnegat, New Jersey, or in, you know, Bordentown, New Jersey. Um, I want to understand the sort of specifics of that. But, look, we want to reward uh, hard work. Uh, we want to uh, embrace and celebrate diversity. There are ways in which it doesn't have to pit people in this kind of zero-sum way. Um, there are, has to be a, a better place to do it. And, and sort of the, uh, uh, I always hate to see sort of the inability for political leaders to find and, and do that hard work of, of finding those comprehensive approaches that, that the Congresswoman was talking about. Oftentimes, the failure to do that then just you know, pits communities against each other. Um, which is uh, just the, the, the worst possible outcome and, and shows a sort of a failure of leadership to really get at it from the front end. One more, and then we need to wrap. You've had your hand up and been very patient. If uh, the woman here. I'd, I'd like to ask about campaign finance. Here comes a microphone. Okay. If you. I'd like to ask about campaign finance, which is an area where uh, there are some real problems, I think, in the political system. Uh, first question is whether you yourselves find that having to raise money for the next election is a burden, and how does that affect your ability to represent your constituents and do the work that, that you'd like to do? And the second is whether you find that uh, being Asian American is an advantage or a disadvantage in raising money. Mm, good question. Um, I don't like to fundraise. I'll guess that Andy Kim does not like to fundraise. But if anyone would ever want to host an event for Andy Kim, <laughs> I won't stop you. <laughs> um, it, it is hard. The, the House actually passed H.R. Uh, 1, right? It had components where it dealt with um, campaign finance, better disclosure and more transparent processes for companies uh, and the monies that uh, are donated to various candidates on both sides of, of the aisle. 
Um, I remember when I was campaigning for Congress in 2012, I got a call from a mainstream reporter who happened to calculate the percentage of um, Asian surnames of my donors. So this person went down my whole list and was surprised that um, a large percentage of my donors were Asian American uh, and that they were from New York. I mean, it's not rocket science. Um, so I don't... What was the implication? <clears throat> well, I don't know. I don't think the article ever came out. I asked if he was calculating the ethnic percentages of my opponent's uh, donor surnames, and then the article never came out. But the implication is, you know, we can, we can all guess you're a smart crowd. Um, so <laughs> advantage is, you know, you know, we meet folks who are excited about us because they might not know anyone who is an Asian American, is a congressperson, et cetera. So that's, you know, very encouraging. Um, but I think sometimes we have to be, you know, so I had to vet all my donors in, in ways that other opponents probably didn't have to. And you're knee deep in a campaign. Yeah. Right? I well, mean, look, I, I mean, I share I share your concerns about campaign finance, and this was something that is very personal to me, um, and something that I'm very passionate about as well to be able to fix. Because having gone through this, and especially when I was telling you that that op that beginning of just like whether or not I'm going to do this, right? I mean, there was a there were definitely a lot of reasons why maybe I wasn't going to do this, and campaign finance was pretty much at the top of the list. You know, for me as uh, someone who was a government employee and never earned six-figure salary before to, to go up against one of the wealthiest members of Congress, it was intimidating. And when I see how much money is involved in politics, it doesn't just shape the questions of like how much time are you fundraising instead of working or, or uh, you know, how much access to wealthy people have uh, because they're your donors. Those are important. But something that I came to understand just having gone through this campaign is that the problem with money in politics fundamentally affects the kind of people that run for Congress and run for office in the first place. And it is something that, lay, lay, that rises, raises this bar so high that you're, you know, I had to go almost two years without a salary to, be, to run for Congress and make sure I can do it full time. And like, you know, it was just brutally difficult on my family financially. And you can see how that would be a barrier to nearly every American from deciding to do this, right? So that is absolutely a reason that we need to, to fix this and make sure that we're tackling this. H.R. 1 that we did was the most comprehensive reform package uh, in decades. Um, but even that's not going to be enough as we live in this era of you know, Citizens United. And I look at my own district, my, in my district, all f money spent in my district, both from campaigns and outside groups, well, it became the high, most expensive house race in New Jersey history, about $24 million spent on this race. Um, which is not something to be proud of. It shows you just how broken it is and, mm -hmm. and why it is that we need to fix this. And um, I find this to be a, a very frustrating part of, of the job, but something that we are hopefully in a position to be able to change and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do. But, you know, when I look back on it, um, uh, it really kind of hits at the issues of en engagement and, and fundamentally, you know, what it is that we are trying to strive for. And I'm hoping that uh, we can make this uh, an issue that's a priority for all Americans to recognize that, you know, you're not going to have uh, good government unless you have good people working in government, but you're also not going to have the type of government that we need until we have a Congress and a government that looks a lot more like the rest of America. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully that's something we can work together on. Um, just a couple of quick notes before we close. One is um, uh, the Asian in America series uh, has been going for some time. It will continue. Looking backward, if any of you want to uh, take a look uh, at AsiaSociety.org, you'll find wraps uh, just sort of curated content uh, from those programs. I'm reminded as you talk about education, we had a really spirited, spirited but very polite spirited discussion about the whole affirmative action and, and the so-called Harvard case, not so-called, the Harvard case, uh, on our stage uh, just a couple of months ago. And if any of you uh, here in the room or beyond have uh, things you'd like to see uh, under that heading, uh, just let us know. You are a very sharp <coughs> audience, and we thank you. Uh, but mostly, um, without getting political about it, uh, this has been really interesting, fun, educational for me. Uh, I hope for the rest of you and for all the troubles you uh, have to deal with, uh, campaign finance and everything else, 
uh, I, I will just go out on a big political limb and say I'm really glad you both uh, have stuck it out, and good luck to you both, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank Appreciate you. It.